Hello. This is a presentation in honour of the 50 years of engineering at Sussex University. Uh, the department we're addressing is the Thermofluid Mechanics Research Centre, the so-called TFMRC, which has been in existence since 1977. Um, the presentation will be done by three different presenters, myself, Martin Rose, Dr. Vasu Kanyirakad and Xin Yang. Um, the main topic of work at the TFMRC is understanding aero engines, and so I thought, I thought a suitable picture would be an A380 on takeoff, so we can see the aero engines, which are Trent 900s. Uh, the history of the TFMRC is uh, quite a long and glorious one. It started with uh, a grant from what was the SRC at the time, the Science Research Council, now EPSERC, um, in 1977. Um, and there have been many industrial sponsors over the years, uh, which are 38 years of existence. Uh, TFMRC specialises in sophisticated experimental rigs um, and has carried out more than 80 PhDs. So there are a lot of people out there with TFMRC PhDs. Um, we've had a very wide variety of, of projects. And uh, within the lab, we have uh, a very special air source, which is a, a Rolls-Royce dart engine, shown here, um, and installed inside the lab, we have the dart engine driving a large compressor and providing us with two megawatts of compressed air, which means we can do a very wide range of high power test rigs. Um, we have in the lab as well a strong focus on computational fluid dynamics, which allows the prediction of features of the flow field. Um, GE Aviation are today our main customer, and we are 11 people in the lab. Uh, now, what do we do at the TFMRC? The, the main thing is to study the flow of fluids, of combustion processes perhaps, of heat and workflows, and of course we also teach because we're a university. Um, but the main focus is on gas turbines because that's the place where these things are very important and, and uh, worthy of study. Gas turbines have very high temperatures. They have very high pressures as well. Um, large velocities at uh, up to 1700 miles per hour. Um, we spin at very high speeds because there are comp compressors and turbines spinning around inside the machine at up to 230 revolutions per second. This is obviously very high speed. This uh, causes the structure to have stresses beyond the plastic level, so the um, uh, the stress analysis of the materials is also important and the machines have very high shaft powers, perhaps up to 50 megawatts in the large machine cases. Now why do we do all this? The reason is because gas turbines are very important for humanity in terms of power generation and also in terms of aircraft, so to let us fly. Um, the high temperatures and pressures which I've mentioned are important because they allow for highly efficient processes and reduce the amount of fuel we have to burn. Um, the understanding we gain from our test rigs allow for better design ultimately of the engines and further improvements of performance. This gives lower pollution, lower CO2 outputs and generally a reduced environmental impact. So these are our motivations. Um, here, in a section entitled, How Do We Do It?, I'm looking at the experimental side of things. We have aero engines such as this, which is a GENX from GE Aviation. At Sussex, we design test rigs to simulate what's going on inside these machines, and we put them in test rigs and measure pressures, temperatures, and velocities, etc. Um, we're also interested in th the three-dimensional aerodynamics of the machinery, and here's an example uh, with what's known as end ball profiling. You can see here the aerofoils of the turbine and the little bumps and lumps in the end wall, which are also present here inside the rotor of the turbine. These change the flow and can influence the secondary loss and therefore the efficiency of the whole machine. Uh, the other side of what we do is computational. And here we have an, a recently published example where we're looking at the 
what's known as the conjugate prediction of the temperature of, of the components of a turbine. We have the finite element model, which is there to predict stresses and temperatures of the metal. And within it, we have a fluid mechanics grid to calculate the flow field. Um, here's a detail of the leading edge of the turbine, and here are the cavities underneath the platforms, which are so important from the point of view of cooling the machine. The calculations are solved together simultaneously, giving us a prediction of the metal temperatures shown down here. Um, the equations that are being solved in the flow cover momentum, continuity and energy, and solving in the material we can look at the stress and temperature field within the material. And the results of such a calculation are then validated with experimental data taken in the test rigs at the TFMRC. So the two activities mesh together and give us uh, better progress. Now for the, for the future, uh, there is an intention to uh, consolidate the work that we're doing currently also to diversify into new technical areas within the gas turbine and within thermofluids. Um, this will involve new partners and new personnel and of course the growth of the lab. Um, for, for, as a technical guide to the future, it is apparent that unsteadiness, this is time resolve flow field, is, is going to be ever more important both in terms of computational work and also in terms of experimental work. And I've represented this as this rather uh, simplified phrase, time is the future. We, we really need to take into account time in more detail. Now as an example of that, I've got a, a couple of pictures in here which are known as URANs. This is unsteady Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, so unsteady CFD. Um, on the right we have a, a an illustration which, which moves with time with the blades going up the page and this is a compressor and we can look at the complex 3D unsteady flow inside it and gain an understanding of how the machine actually functions. Um, but we're also interested in experimental work with time resolution and, and here I have a, a video of uh, some Travis data taken in a machine in ETH Zurich when I was working there and we can look at the flow coming out of a turbine rotor and see how the blades rotate. These yellowy white features are the wakes of the rotor and we're looking from downstream and if I activate it you should see that the blades are moving across and that the flow is very complex. We have loss cores, we have tip leakage, there, there are lots of things going on and understanding the detail of this will lead to better design. Down in the corner here, hopefully you can see it, is uh, another aspect of, of time resolved for the future. And this is a total temperature probe, a probe designed to measure the total temperature of the fluid. And it measures it at high frequency, 50 kilohertz. So it's high enough that you can actually see the blades coming by. Um, and it's tiny, it's one millimeter diameter made of glass. And this is actually an electron microscope picture so you can see the gauge, hopefully, on the surface. So in the future, we will be doing experimental work with time resolution. Now, the rest of the presentation is being given by my two colleagues. Uh, that's Dr. Vasu Kanyirakad, who's going to be talking about the experimental work, and Dr. Xin Yang, who's going to be talking about the computational work. So thank you very much, and I will now hand over to Vasu. Uh, thank you, Martin, for that presentation. Um, uh, as Martin described, uh, my part of the presentation here is really to explain the experimental aspect of the work that uh, we're currently uh, are doing at the Thermofluid uh, Mechanics Research Center. And this work is uh, sponsored by GE Aviation uh, in Cincinnati in the United States. Um, to give you a short uh, introduction about what GE Aviation is all about, they are uh, uh, a subsidiary of the uh, General Electric Conglomerate, which is one of the largest corporations in the world. Um, and uh, they were formerly known as the GE Aircraft Engines. And as the name suggests, they are involved in the business of uh, producing uh, gas turbine engines that power uh, aircrafts. Um, and they employ over 40,000 uh, people in GE Aviation alone and through other uh, arms that they have, um, even more people. And their revenue is about um, 20 billion uh, US dollars, uh, and um, they're one of the leading producers of uh, gas turbine engine. 
uh, in the world, especially in the civil aviation sector. They lead the market by over 60% of the market share, the rest being shared by the likes of uh, Rolls-Royce and uh, Pratt & Whitney. Uh, just to give you an idea about some of the most familiar engines, or, or I should say um, aircrafts that we might have flown in uh, that use these engines, there are the B, uh, Boeing 747s that use the CF-6 engine. Uh, then there are the single air, uh, single aisle aircrafts, uh, such as the ones that we use for domestic flights. They use uh, the um, uh, the uh, CFM-56 engine for uh, aircraft such as Boeing 737 and A320s. Uh, there's the G90, which is one of the largest ever produced uh, turbofan engine with a power or thrust in excess of uh, 500 kilonewtons, uh, and that's used to power the um, the wide body 777 uh, Boeing aircrafts. And there's a Gen X um, engine which powers the Dreamliner, or uh, what's known as a Boeing 787. Um, our collaboration with GE Aviation uh, started in earnest in the uh, late uh, 2011. Uh, October, November period to be specific. And this is particularly important for me personally because that's also the time I started with Sussex. And one of the first things I um, did after joining Sussex is to actually conduct a feasibility study to uh, look at the suitability of our research uh, facilities for a General Electric um, uh, um, interests uh, or their research interests. Um, and uh, these uh, tests were conducted successfully, and the results were uh, acceptable to GE, and, and they went on to fund uh, two major projects that's worth over a million uh, uh, pounds, um, GBP. And these projects were, uh, will be carried out through using two different rigs. Uh, one is a, known as a multiple cavity rig that simulates compressor rotor-rotor cavity uh, flow and uh, heat transfer. Uh, and the other one is the purge rig um, um, facility that is used for um, simulating the wheel space cavity in a turbine environment. And I'll go in detail to, uh, into describing these rigs in a minute, but I'd like to give you some idea about what um, secondary air system in a turbine are, because that's what this research uh, is concerned with. Um, what you see here is a a general, a general arrangement of a gas turbine engine, particularly the high bypass ratio turbofan engine. And w when you look at this, the first thing that you notice is a big fan at the front of the engine. That's what you normally see as you climb up to uh, on board a, a, on an aircraft. But what you don't see pro probably is what's behind it, which is the core turbine, uh, and which, is, um, which actually is driving the fan at the front. And this is made up of um, a compressor, a combustor and a turbine. And the compressor basically compresses ambient air into 40 to 50 times the ambient pressure. And um, this is then um, uh, flown through a combustor where fuel is burned, where temperature of the air is raised to uh, temperatures of the order of 2,000 Kelvin, which is well above the melting point of some of the components, uh, the material limits of the components. And uh, this is then taken out through or expanded through a set of turbines at the back end where uh, work is extracted or power is extracted from the from the working fluid and this is then uh, in turn used to drive the compressor at the front and the fan at the front. So this is how roughly how a um, turbofan engine works and what I would like to uh, explain to you next is um, a bit about the secondary air system. Um, uh, that's uh, the, the two major uh, flow regimes of the turbine. Uh, and here we have uh, the same picture with, um, with a red region highlighted that shows the primary air system, which basically uh, consists of the air that flows through the, the rotors and the stators, uh, rotor blades and the stator blades and the combustors uh, of the turbine and the compressor. And this is uh, mainly responsible for producing uh, useful power hence it's called the primary system. And what you have below the hub line and around the, the main analyst is what's known as a secondary air system. Although this doesn't produce uh, useful power, um, this is very important in terms of uh, enabling the uh, turbine to produce power in a safe and um, efficient manner. Because 
the secondary air system is responsible for providing uh, cooling air for the hot components of the turbine and also for producing sealing air between high pressure and low pressure systems, which a leakage between which would actually reduce the performance of the engine. Uh, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to two particular examples that we are directly concerned with. One of them is called the compressor uh, rotor cavity uh, system. So the blue region here uh, from the same GA that you saw earlier is kind of um, expanded and uh, enlarged to show you the details of it. So what you see there is the rotor disc uh, arrangement that hold the uh, success successive rotor rows of a, or rotor blades of a compressor. And the large arrows here uh, shows the air that's being drawn out from the main flow, or this is a bleed air, uh, that is taken out into these cavities. And then they are uh, routed through the bore of the engine uh, between, the, uh, between the corpse and the, the central shaft of the engine to uh, various regions that requires cooling and sealing air. Um, this is particularly important to study because these cavities uh, produce, um, these rotating cavities produce uh, frictional heating, windage heating, and uh, the air in the cavity uh, is usually f uh, 50 to 100 degrees Celsius above uh, the temperature um, of the main flow. And um, the complicated interactions between the bore flow and the cavity flow and the buoyancy effects that are uh, involved uh, due to the presence of uh, heated disks uh, is um, very difficult to predict and analyze numerically. So uh, high standard experimentation is essential to understand uh, the nature of flow in, this, um, in these cavities. And why this is important? Because uh, that heat transfer and flow basically governs the temperature of these disks and that of the coolant flow itself that goes on to cool and seal uh, high temperature and high pressure uh, um, components of the turbine. Um, another example that I would like to draw your attention to is what's known as the uh, turbine wheel space cavity. So as uh, in the previous slide, I've drawn on a small area which is expanded and uh, enlarged uh, at the bottom image here. And what you can see is the turbine uh, nozzle guide vane and the turbine rotor. And they are attached to corresponding disc poles and what we have in between the disc pores is a cavity, which is a rotor stator cavity. And it's also known as the purge cavity or the turbine wheel space. Um, now, you can possibly see uh, an axial seal between the two uh, uh, disc pores that is there to prevent any hot air from the turbine main floor, the primary floor, leaking into these cavities and hence causing uh, a heat damage to the discs and also to the, to the secondary air system air that is used for cooling the turbine blades themselves. So that process where you have um, uh, hot air moving into the, uh, into the cavities is known as ingestion process. This could be prevented to some extent by actually providing what's known as purge air, which is basically the secondary air system air that we bled off from the compressor as we saw in the previous slide. And this would pressurize this cavity and then um, that air is basically mixed with the main flow or the primary flow. Um, so the purge air, although prevents the ingestion, a uh, large amount of purge flow can actually be detrimental to the aerodynamics of the main flow uh, because it would um, create mixing and um, other types of losses. So the important uh, aspect is to find the right balance between an al uh, allowable ingestion and um, a minimum purge that is required to prevent that ingestion. And that's where the research uh, would be concentrating on. Um, coming back to uh, Thermofluid Mechanics Research Center research background, uh, some of the pioneering work of the years in this area, or secondary system area, has been done um, at the research. And uh, you can see a list of names here, which I won't go through individually. But um, uh, some of them would be present today in this um, uh, celebrations. So I'd like to thank them for the, the great work they have done over the years. And you can see a picture over there, which is a background image, which basically is one of the classical images that of, um, of um, the flow structure inside a rotating cavity um, that was um, published, uh, uh, identified and published 
in a paper in the uh, late 80s uh, by researchers at the Thermal Fluids uh, Research Center. Um, so in order to conduct the research uh, experiments that we have with um, uh, GE, we have two main research vehicles. One is known as a multiple cavity rig, uh, and um, this is basically um, simulating a simplified version of an HP compressor, high pressure compressor, rotor rotor cavity system, as we saw in one of the previous slides. And here is a uh, cut section view of the multiple cavity rig. Uh, what you can see is uh, five um, rotor disks uh, bunched together, uh, and they rotate about a central shaft. And the bore flow that we discussed earlier uh, is actually introduced from the right hand side of the um, that image, as you can see. Uh, through a system of cavities, and they go through the bore of the, um, the rig, and then they out uh, goes out through the exit on the uh, uh, on the uh, left hand side. Um, we simulate the heat input provided by the primary air um, in the turbine by actually uh, pumping in heat using um, electric heaters, as denoted by the arrow mark here. Uh, and what we are interested in is the interaction between the bore flow and the cavity flow, and how the um, heat transfer and um, um, temperature of the disk is how it is guided by that. So this rig is basically um, um, uh, made for that purpose. And here is a uh, another image of the rig, which is a, a, a real photograph of the rig, and you can possibly pick up a couple of the uh, important. Uh, features one is a one is a casing uh, around the um, around the rotating um, drum, and you can see the individual heaters that provide the heat input to the to the to the uh, discs, and you can also see the telemetry system here, which is uh, basically used for transferring thermocouple um, rotating thermocouple signals from the rotor to a stationary instrumentational uh, signal processing system uh, outside uh, of the rig. And you can also see a 3D cut view of the uh, uh, of the rig, and clearly seeing showing the the central shaft and the rotating disks there. Um, so basically, the facility simple is a simplified form of um, an HP compressor rotor rotor cavity system. Uh, it can produce realistic axial and rotational Reynolds numbers, um, and um, uh, it has. TCs or thermocouples, both in the rotating and stationary frames of reference. Uh, we also have an LDA capability, which basically tracks the velocity field inside these cavities, which is quite important uh, to, uh, to measure in order to analyze um, uh, the, the thermodynamics uh, within these cavities. Uh, the main airflow into the rig is provided by an atlas core compressor, which can provide up to 0.8 kilograms per second of air at a pressure of about 6.5 uh, bar uh, absolute. Um, and uh, the air is delivered in a cooled and dried condition to about 25 degrees Celsius. And with the limits of what we can achieve uh, in terms of uh, heating and rotation and both mass flow rate, uh, we are looking at typical Reynolds uh, numbers of uh, rotational Reynolds numbers of the order of 15 million. Axial Reynolds numbers of the order of 0.2 million, and a heating uh, parameter or a, or a buoyancy parameter, uh, beta delta t of, of the order of 0.4. Um, the other rig that we have is a purge flow rig, which is basically a turbine rig uh, that simulates the wheel space cavity uh, that uh, we uh, discussed in one of the previous slides. Um, here is a um, cross sectional view of the uh, turbine facility in its previous incarnation. This facility is currently undergoing uh, modifications to uh, suit G GE's requirements. Um, and in this incarnation, it's basically a two-stage turbine with a stator rotor, um, a stator rotor arrangement. And you can clearly see the, um, the cavities that are present beneath the hub line there, which, uh, uh, which interacts with um, the main flow. And you can also see the shrouded second uh, second um, stage stator. Uh, and this particular configuration was uh, designed with a view of um, um, of studying the, the heat transfer and aerodynamics in the in the shroud cavity. Uh, here is a uh, uh, an actual photograph of um, uh, the the setup, and you can 
kind of pick up on the inlet pipe work that uh, that supplies the main flow into the turbine, uh, the, the and the test section over there, and there's also the dynamometer that absorbs the power generated by the turbine, and it also allows us to measure the torque uh, generated by the turbine, which is uh, useful for uh, calculating the performance of the of the um, engine of the of the of the rig of the turbine rig, and on the on the right-hand side, you can see another cut view of the three-dimensional CAD model, uh, clearly showing the two stages of uh, stators, which are in blue, and the rotor blades, which are in red, and the cavities beneath them. Uh, the purge flow rig, as I said, simulates the HP, uh, the, the wheel space cavity, especially of a high-pressure turbine uh, stage. Um, it has both rotating and stationary thermocouple uh, probes, just like uh, the other rig, the cav cavity rig that we have. Uh, it has various pressure and displacement sensors that um, track what's happening within the flow field and within the components in terms of pressure and uh, movement of components. We can also track the movement of um, uh, secondary air or purge air by seeding it with ca carbon dioxide and tracing it downstream as it progresses through the turbine. Uh, the dynamometer, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in the previous slide, uh, enables us to measure the torque and the performance of the, uh, of the uh, turbine stage. And the main airflow, which is the, the, the primary airflow for the turbine, is provided by a modified uh, Rolls-Royce Dart aero engine, which has a driven compressor that provides uh, a flow rate of up to 10 kilogram per second at an absolute pressure of 3.5 bar. and um, um, a temperature of about 160 degrees Celsius. Um, and the cooling air and the purge air, the secondary air, is actually provided by uh, the same Atlas Copco compressor that uh, I described in the previous slide. Um, so coming back to the collaboration uh, status with GE, uh, the two research work is currently, well, both uh, research projects are currently ongoing. Uh, one of the rigs, the multiple cavity rig experiments are being conducted as we speak. And um, the other, um, the, the turbine rig is being uh, put together at the moment. And in the long term, we expect to uh, continue our relationship uh, with uh, GE Aviation beyond the two projects that we currently have. We expect to uh, collaborate with GE on other aspects of um, turbine aerodynamics and heat transfer, like Martin before me explained into the unsteadiness uh, of uh, unsteady aerodynamics of components, and also the numerical. Uh, side of the research, which my colleague uh, Dr. Xi Yang would uh, describe to you in a uh, in a minute, and we also would like to possibly collaborate with other arms of uh, GE Aviation, which are based in Europe uh, and, and and in India. And uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll now like to hand over to my colleague Xi Yang. Hello, my name is Xi Yang. As Martin mentioned in his introduction. The key thing for simulation is unsteadiness, so that's where I'm going to talk about to you the approach, or the best approach, I think, for simulating unsteady flow, which is called large air simulation, and its application. So first of all, I'll tell you what is large air simulation, and why I think it's the best approach, and I'll give you some applications to, for you to feel the application of it, and then draw some concluding remarks. As we all know, turbulent flow consists of different scales of motions. We call them large-scale motion, small-scale motion, or we call them large eddy or small eddy. So as you can see from this picture, that's just a snapshot, a frozen picture. But of course, all those ideas are changing, evolving with time as well. So now, what is large eddy simulation? So basically, what we do, we try to compute large eddies directly so that is really called large air simulation. Of course, if you compute all scales of motions, that, that's called direct numerical simulation, or called DNS. Okay? And of course, in large air simulations, we only compute large edits directly. Then what do we do with small ideas? We have to model them using our so-called subgrid scale models. On the other hand, now, if you model all those ideas, then that's really what called reload average never stokes approach. And why large ideas simulation is really working? Because large ideas dominate flow physics. It's really 
responsible for most of the heat transfer, momentum transfer, etc. And also because small eddies are relatively easy to model, but large eddies are very hard to model. So if you want to model all of them, then you inevitably it's not very accurate. But if you can capture those large eddies directly, when you model those small eddies, which are easier to handle, or we call them isotropic, so then that's really why large eddy work, large eddy simulation works. So here let me give you just give you a feel of what we've been doing here, trying to develop large eddy simulation capabilities here. And then I go through four examples. The first one here is really just trying to understand the fundamental flow physics involved in your separated boundary transition. So you can see nebula flow coming here, and uh, there's a free shear layer forming, and which is unstable due to carrying Helmholtz instability as goes to transition. Although that's a simple flow, but then the physics is very rich and uh, not really well understood after the primary instability stage. Next one is really to develop various capability for so-called pre-mixed combustion systems. And this picture is very complicated. It's really a laboratory setup of experimental rig. But I want to just to focus our simulation really focusing in this area here. So you have the air flowing radially, actually, and then you have a few injection here. And then it's pre-mixed in this pre-mixed duct and burn in the combustion chamber. So if in the numerical model, the geometry can be slightly simplified like this. So you can see the air coming both from radian and actually here. And now kerosene, you can imagine if it's air sort of the, the gas turbine for the aircraft, jet engine kerosene were injected from here, it were pre-mixed in this region before it burned. And there are a lot of advantages with this kind of combustion system, but one of the biggest problems is really called a flashback. So combustion actually not happening there, but happening here. If that happens, it will cause disaster. Now, for a particular design, if we use so-called Ryan's approach, and that's just a calculation of flow field, and what you will conclude is, ha, ah, the flow field looks very nice. There's no reverse flow going to the premixed room is here. So you would say that's a good design. But in reality, that's not the case. So that is the LES prediction. And you can see for that particular design, from time to time, you do have really reverse flow coming from the combustion chamber to the mixed duct room, which really indicates flashback could happen there. Next example is really two-phase flow. And because we are really concentrating on the gas turbine in the TFMRC, so we are really, the, the two-phase flow we are looking at is really very relevant to fuel injectors. So here, just some background, if you have a liquid fuel inject into a surrounding turbine airflow, and what will happen is it involves a very complex physical process. We can broadly divide them into so-called primary breakup, which really involves those liquid jets break into chunks of liquids, and then we call it a secondary break up. Those, those big liquid chunk will further break up into some very small droplets before eventually it will evaporate and burn. So here, that picture really just demonstrates you really we can capture the whole break, the break process, focusing here really on the secondary break up. So we have liquid drops coming here with surrounding turbulent air, and then to simulate how it breaks up into millions of tiny droplets, and eventually it will evaporate and burn further downstream. The last example I'm going to give you is really about combustion itself. That is really, again, a premixed combustion. So you have, you have premixed air and fuel from the duct into the combustion chamber. And what you're looking at here is really the velocity, flow, velocity fields, temperature fields, and the density fields. And it's clearly indicated to you, you can see from here, the flame front. So you have a recirculation region here, which really the hot 
burnt gas coming back, reignited, and then the flame will be stabilized in this region. But that's just the snapshots, and again, reality is very unsteady. It's moving all the time. Really, I just want to quickly draw some conclusions. I say area is the most suitable numerical approach for at least, I think, 20 years, because, as I mentioned before, DNS is very accurate, but it's very, very expensive. Currently, it's only used for low reload number flow for very simple geometry, mainly for research purpose, hardly used for any practical engineering flow. Where your runs is definitely not accurate enough, as Martin mentioned in the, in the introduction, we really want to do time resolved simulation. But of course, the challenges facing RES is really sort of, there are a lot of them, that's not an ex exclusive list. It's really just a list of some major points from a personal point of view. An efficient, accurate numerical methods, that's mainly for unstructured grids, which really still needs to be developed because for unstructured grids, it's even very hard to maintain second order, second order accuracy. So we need really efficient and accurate numerical methods for unstructured grids. And one of the biggest problems for RES or even for DNS is the generation of realistic inflow boundary conditions. But remember that we're doing time resolved simulation, which means at your inflow, you need to provide time resolved information. But normally we can't get that from experiments because it's just too hard to measure. So somehow we have to generate that information, but that is extremely difficult to generate realistic information with the right first or second order moments, with the right spectrum, with the right correlation, etc. And also, we need, also need to do model the sort of the small scale motions better, especially because in practical engineering flows, real number could be very high. We can't afford a very fine mesh. When your mesh is becoming coarser, then you really need a good subgrid scale model to do the work. So that's really, I think, needs a lot of work. And the last thing is the bottleneck for RES a lot of times is just in the near world region, because in the near world region, the motion, the scales are very small. If you want to resolve all the small scale motions, you really need to have very fine mesh, and that's really restrict areas in a lot of applications. One way to around this is to approximate the near wall region using so-called wall functions, but the wall functions are mostly developed for RANS approach, not really for RES approach. As I mentioned, that's not really the exclusive list, there are a lot of challenges facing RES, but we are ready to deal with it. And uh, that's all I want to talk about. And uh, thank you very much for your attention.